we'll start. Today's daf is Kufnun Hay. We're going to start with the new Mishnah in the middle of Kufnun Hay, which is where we left off yesterday. Um, and it deals with feeding animals, basically, is the topic. So, uh, the Mishnah says, Matirin paki'e amir lefnei behema, ome paspesin etakipin. So, what this means is, you can open up bundles of straw to feed the animals. And uh, in front of the animal, umipaspesin takipin means you can spread out. In other words, you don't just you can you can spread out the uh, these items in front of the animal, whatever the keeping are. We're going to see that there's a bit of an argument in the Gemara right away. What keeping are? Everybody agrees that paki amir refers to these bundles of straw. The question is, what is the keeping exactly, and what is the next word that's going to be used, which is avaloata zirin? You can't do this with the zirin. We don't know exactly what that is yet. The Gemara is going to say that one of these two things is another type of straw. And one of these two things is, uh, is actually moist branches of cedar. But they're going to argue which one is which and what you're allowed to do with each. So that's going to be an interesting discussion. Um, and that's going to form basically the next two guys we're going to see. That's going to be what it revolves around. Ein mirasikin lo etashachat falo etaharuvin. So you can't basically chop um, chop them finely uh, shachat is a type of animal fodder or uh, haruvin or carobs lifnei behema in front of an animal ben daka ben gasa whether it is a small animal or a large animal rabbi, rabbi Yehuda matir b'charuvin daka. rabbi Yehuda says you can chop carobs for a small animal so we're going to see what this what are the principles here okay so the Mishnah is very but it just makes its statements and doesn't exactly tell us what the issues are at hand. The Gemara is going to present basically two theoretical models for understanding the Mishnah. And based on these the- theoretical models, you're going to read the Mishnah totally differently. Mm-hmm. The flow of the Mishnah is very interesting. So, first we have like this. Amar Ravuna, Ravuna says, Hen, hen, paki'in, hen, hen, kipin. The first two things mentioned in the Mishnah are exactly the same. Kipin and, pa- and uh, pa- paki'in and kipin are the same thing. Namely, straw bundles. Paki'in tere, kipin tlata. Paki'in are, uh, are a t- have uh, two, their two ends are tied. And kipin have, are tied in three places. Okay, not just the two ends, but also I guess the middle is tied as well. But these are really just two types of straw. Bundles. Yeah, bundles of straw. So, zirin de arze. Zirin, that is the third thing mentioned in the Mishnah, are branches of cedar. So now, how, does, how is the Mishnah read according to this approach? According to Rafa Navachi Kamar, Matirin Pakei Amir. If we reread the Mishnah, he'll read it like this. You can untie bundles of straw that are tied with two ties. Lifnei behema. So the way that he reads it is that for the bundles of straw that have only two ties on the end, you can untie them and you can spread them out in front of the animal. And you can also do that for the straw that's tied at three points. Okay, for both kinds of bundles, you can, you can t- untie them and you can spread them out. So even though the Mishnah sounded like it was saying there were two different activities, it said that you could untie the bundles, the first thing, the paki'in, and you could spread out the kipin. It was really saying you could do both to both. It was just using two different verbs to describe what you can do to both of them, because they're both really the same thing. Okay? Avalot has zirin, but you cannot, lo the paspes, lo the hatir, you cannot untie bundles of cedar wood and you cannot spread them out. Amar Rav Chista, Rav Chista said, "My Tamad Rav Huna, what is the theory behind Rav Huna's reading of the Mishnah? It is because Kasavar the Mitrach ba Ochla Tarchina, the Shavye Ochla Lo Mishavinan. That according to him, in order to, that if you are going to per- perfect or enhance food, it's allowed." But to make something, food is not allowed. And basically, when the straw is in a bundle, it's still edible. If the animal wants to eat it, it could eat it in the bundle. The only thing is, it doesn't, it's, you know, when it's not spread out, when it's not untied, it's maybe harder for the animal to access, or maybe it's, you know, the smell doesn't waft up, Rashi says, as much when it's tied together, or whatever the case may be. But for the sticks, sticks are used for firewood, or they're used for something else. And they're not really even considered food until you untie them. 
As long as they're tied in a bundle, you assume they're for firewood anyway. So the fact that you are untying them is basically making them into, or you're spreading them out, is making them food for the animal. That you're not allowed to do, says Rav Huna. <laughs> Rav Yehuda, Amar Rav Yehuda says, I'm going to read the Mishnah in a totally different way. Because I have a totally different theory about the principle here. Hen, hen, pakin, hen, hen, zirin. The first and third things in the Mishnah are straw. Okay? Pakin, tere, zirin, telata. Zirin, uh, that these two things are the same. That the, the, the uh, straw that's tied on two ends is the first thing mentioned in the Mishnah where it says that you can untie it. The zirin, the thing that it says you can't do anything, that you cannot spread out, right? The third thing in the Mishnah is talking about the, the is also the uh, straw, but the straw that's tied at three places. Vehachikamar, so let's read, and then kipin de arze. And what are the cedar sticks? That's the kipin, the middle, the middle term is the, is the cedar sticks. Okay? So now let's read the way that he's going to read the Mishnah. Vehachikamar, that's how I'm going to read the Mishnah in light of my theory. Matirin pakea mirafme behema aval pispuselo. You can untie the bundles that are tied in two places, but you can't spread them out. You can just untie them, which is if you read the Mishnah literally, that's what it says. Matirin pake amir, you can untie it. Ume pas pasinat the kipin, and you can spread out the kipin. So if you're reading the Mishnah this way, you're reading that you can only untie the bundles of straw that are tied in two places. The kipin, and the kipin, which according to Rabbi, Rabbi, according to Rav Yehuda, is referring not to the cedars, not to the other kinds of straw, Straw, but to the cedars, the kipin pispusenami mepaspesinan. You can untie them and spread them out. Avalo hazirin lepaspes el alhatir. But when it comes to the straw that's tied in three places, you cannot spread it out. You can only untie it, which means to say that according to him, you can untie straw, but you can't spread it out. You can untie and spread out cedar sticks. So what is his theory? Amar Rav Rav says, "My Tamad Rav Yehuda. Why is Rav Yehuda compelled to read the Mishnah this way? Because he says, 'Kasavar Shavuye Ochala Mishavina Mitrach Ochala Lo Tarchinan.' He says the opposite of what Rav Huna says. That what are you allowed to do? You can make a food edible that wasn't edible at all before, but you can't make it easier for the animal. That's an unnecessary exertion on Shabbat." How much are you going to work for the animal? How much do you have to make it more pleasant for the animal? That you're not allowed to go to great effort to do. But if there's something here which is essentially inedible or it's not food, like the sticks that are bundled are for firewood, and there's no way the animal can eat the sticks that are bundled like that. There's, it's just not going to work. You're going to have to untie them and you're going to have to spread them out for the animal to eat them. Straw, on the other hand, is food. It's just harder for the animal to access it, so we untie the, we untie the bundles of straw to make it, to put it in a form where it's edible. But we don't have to to spread it out. For the sticks, we have to spread it out to make it edible to the animal. So whatever is necessary to make it bottom line edible, according to Rabbi Yudah, is permitted. Whatever is being done in order to make it more pleasant for the animal is not necessary and therefore it's excessive exertion. This is precisely the opposite of what Rav Huna says. Rav Huna says that whatever you need to do to make it more, more appealing or to facilitate the animal's eating, that's allowed. Whatever you're doing that makes it food is not allowed. Okay, so we have diametrically opposed theories here. We learned in the Mishnah that you can't chop fodder and you can't chop carobs in front of an animal, whether it be a small animal or a large animal. My love, aren't we talking about carobs that are similar to fodder? Aren't we saying that we're talking about soft fodder and soft carobs? And it shows you that what? You're, even though these things are soft, right? Even so, these things are soft, and you're just making it easier, right? That shows you that you're not allowed to make things easier. You're only allowed to do activities that make the food edible based on a basic level. But since the fodder is soft and the carobs are soft, all you're doing is making it easier for the animal, and that's not necessary. Amar lach Rav Huna, Rav Huna will defend himself and say, "Lo, No, it's the opposite way. You're assuming we're talking about fodder that's soft, and we're talking about carobs that are similar to fodder. I'm going to say the opposite. It's fodder that's similar to carobs. We're talking about hard fodder and hard carobs. Hechi mashkachat la be'ile zutre, and we're to, um, what. What is hard fodder? Isn't all fodder soft? What well, we're talking about, young um, donkeys. With young donkeys, they have a problem. Young donkeys, they need the food to be chopped very, very finely. So even fodder that might be good for other animals, for them it's not good. 
And we're talking about carobs that might be hard for whatever animal they're being fed to. So we're talking, but Rav Huna will say that we are speaking of foods that are not edible in their current state at all to, the, to their intended recipients or to their intended consumers. So that's why you're allowed to do it. But just to make it more pleasant, we're not going to allow it. Tashma, come in here, another proof. Rabbi Yehuda, Matir Haruvin, Ladaka. It says that Rabbi, Yehuda, that Rabbi Yehuda in the Gemara, in the Mishnah, we're not talking about Rav Yehuda, who is the, who's arguing against Rav Huna. We're talking about Rabbi Yehuda, the opinion in the Mishnah, because the Mishnah said that according to the Tanakhama, you cannot chop carobs and you cannot chop fodder for any animal. And Rabbi Yehuda said for a small animal, you can chop the carobs. Right? So the Gemara says, let's analyze this position. Now, what is Rabbi Yehuda saying? He's saying you can only chop the carobs for a small animal, not for a large one. So, that he holds, if you're going to say that the Tanakhama holds like Rav Yehuda, that you can make food edible, but you can't improve the food. You can't make it more enticing. You can just make it basically edible. So then I know the Kama Rabbi Yehuda. So then we can understand what Rabbi Yehuda is saying. That Rabbi Yehuda is coming along and saying, well, you don't have to chop these carobs for a large animal because it's not necessary. But it is necessary for a small animal. And if I'm allowed to do what's necessary for the animal to make this edible, I should be allowed. And we can understand why he says it's only for the small animal and not for the large animal. However, But if we're going to say like Rav Huna, the exact opposite, that you're not allowed to make something into a food, but you're allowed to improve it, Rabbi Yehuda, the Matei B'charavin, the Dakar Kol Shekhen that according to Rabbi Yehuda that says you can only do this for a small animal it makes no sense because if it's an improvement for a small animal it's certainly an improvement for a large animal so if we're going to say that we're talking about necessity it makes sense because we could say what's necessary for the small animal is not going to be necessary for the large animal to eat it but if we're talking about ease of consumption if we're talking about improvement uh, enhancement then what's an enhancement for the small animal is going to be an enhancement for the large animal as well so we have a big problem how can Rav Huna read the Mishnah like this how is Rav Huna going to say that the, the first part of the Mishnah was saying uh, that enhancements are okay and Rabbi Yehuda says well and it's an enhancement for a small animal but not a large animal that doesn't make any sense at all so therefore the Gemara tries to refute this by saying well Misa Rav Daka Daka Mamash Rav Huna could answer you as follows and say Daka doesn't mean a small animal in which case your point would be well taken My Daka Gasa Daka here means a large animal that, I agree that that sounds bizarre, but umay karila daka. Why is it calling it daka? Didaika beochla. What it means is when you have an animal that's particular about what it eats. Okay, it's a finicky animal. It's not talking about size. Okay, size you wouldn't be able to make a distinction between small and large. Where the small, it was where it was an enhancement for the small and not an enhancement for the large. But you could say that it's it's you're dealing with a finicky animal where it's an enhancement when it's an enhancement for the animal because it's finicky um, and it prefers a certain type of food even though it's not necessary but it prefers it. You can do it. But the Gemara says it's not going to work either because the Tanakhama said you can't do this for a large animal or a small animal. Rabbi Yehuda says only for a small animal you can. Right? I agree with you. A large animal you can't. A small animal you can't. So that's a big problem. Kashya. We can't answer it now because Rabbi Yehuda is not talking about a finicky animal. Rabbi Yehuda is responding to the Tanakhama. The Tanakhama said whether it's large or small it's not allowed. Rabbi Yehuda said no it is allowed for small. So he definitely means small. Right? Now it would be hard to say that he means finicky and that the rabbis were talking about that because it doesn't seem like they're talking about that. So we're going to have a lot of trouble reconciling Rabbi Yehuda's opinion or the flow of the Mishnah with Rav Huna's interpretation because of this problem of Rabbi Yehuda. Because if the whole concept of the Mishnah is that you're allowed to do enhancements for food, so then it doesn't make much sense that something would be an enhancement for a small animal and not for a large one. Now Rashid does cite one possible uh, way of reading the Mishnah that he rejects he says it's not the way the Mishnah has to be read but he does say that I guess it could have been possible to read it although the Gemara did not want to read it this way it might have been possible for the Gemara to read it that the Tanakhama according to Rav Huna holds that it's about enhancements and that Rabbi Yehuda holds that it's about necessity in other words that the Machloket in the Gemara is really the Machloket in the Mishnah 
But the Tanakama, Rav Huna could have said, yeah, yeah, the Tanakama agrees with me that it goes by enhancements. Rabbi Yehuda is coming along and saying, no, 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 it goes by what's necessary, not by enhancements. But Rashi says that the Gemara didn't want to do that because if that's the case, then, Rab, then, then the Gemara would have asked, then, then why doesn't Rabbi Yehuda also allow you to spread out the cedar sticks? Right? Because he's saying that necessity is always okay. All right, so, that, so that's, a, that's another issue. So basically, it's very difficult for Rafuna. So Tashma come in here, another proof. You can cut up gourds in front of an animal. And you can cut up uh, the uh, flesh of, uh, of animals. Because what they would, if they had a nivela, if they had an animal that was slaughtered and the slaughtering was botched, or an animal died of its own accord, they would throw the meat to the dogs. So you can chop this up in front of the kalavim. My love, the lady the nevela. Aren't we talking about gourds that are just like meat? Ma nevela de rakicha abdelo in de rakiche. Just like the nevela, just like the meat is soft, so too we're talking about uh, a case where the gourds are soft. Al ma tarchinan boochla vetiuvta de rav yehuda. This seems to support rav huna because what is it saying? It's saying that you can cut up soft stuff. Even though the animal could have eaten it without that, you can cut it up in its soft state and give it to the animals. You're making it easier for the animals. I disagree. It's the opposite way. We're, the, really, we're talking about nevela that's similar, meat that's similar to gourds. How so? Because that we're talking about gourds that are hard and meat that's hard. What is a, what's hard meat? We're talking about Elephant, elephant meat. Okay, I guess they would sometimes feed that to the animals because it's obviously non kosher meat that was available at that time. Inami, alternatively, Biguria Tazutreya, we're talking about small cubs that need the food to be cut into very, that even if the food itself might be soft, but we're, deal, we're dealing with, um, we, we need to chop it in, uh, in a, into small, uh, I'm sorry, we're talking about small, in other words, small, yeah, small dogs that they need the food to be chopped into small pieces for them to be able to eat it. Uh, so even if it may be, um, you know, even if it may be that the, the meat itself is regular meat, but unless you chop it into small pieces, they're not going to be able to eat it, so it's not edible at all. So Rev. Yehuda will maintain this position that it must, be e- it must be that you're making it edible in order to have to do it. If it's already edible and you're just making it easier, it's not going to be good. So, Tashma, come and listen to Tani Rav Hanan Mehene Hardea. Rav Hanan from the Harda taught Mefarchinan Teven Vespasta Uma Arvin that you can break up, you can crush Teven, you can crush uh, straw for the animals, Vespasta, and you can crush fodder. So even though it, it's edible in its current state, Uma Arvin, and you can mix it up with water to make it for the animals. Alma Tarchina Bochla. So it seems like that means that you can make it easier for the animals because obviously straw is edible in its current state. Obviously fodder is soft and edible in its current state. You're making it more readily accessible to the animal. You're, you're enhancing it. So the answer is betivna sarya aspasta beile zutre. So again, we'll say according to Rabbi Yehuda that no, this is talking about a case where it really wasn't edible without crushing it. It really wasn't edible without mixing it with water. Why? Either because we're talking about Tivnasar, yeah, we're talking about somewhat spoiled or moldy straw. So until it was crushed up, it wouldn't have been um, edible to the animal. It wouldn't have been able to eat it. Or, um, and, uh, and why is that? So Rashi says, de la chazia, normally it wouldn't be for food, this uh, sort of uh, rotted, uh, you know, rotted straw. He's making it into food. It doesn't mean it's totally ruined. He says, because if it was totally ruined, then that would have just been for cement. But it means it's getting ruined. So you're making it food by crushing it up so that it's edible because it was getting, it was, you know, I guess by mixing it all together, it sort of nullifies uh, some of the yuckiness and the animal will now eat it. Same thing with the, um, you know, with aspasta. When we're talking about uh, fodder here, we're talking about for, young, for the young uh, donkey. And we said that the young donkey needs everything to be broken very small for it to be able to eat. So therefore, uh, that's how the Gemara concludes. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, reach a conclu- conclusion either way in terms of Rav Yehuda or Rav Huna. 
We're not able to refute either side definitively. We're not able to support either side definitively. It does seem like you, you know there are Mishnayot that more easily fit with Rav Huna. There are Mishnayot here that more easily fit with uh, Rav Yehuda. At the end of the day, though, if you look back, you'll see that the halacha follows, the definitive halacha is following uh, Rav Yehuda's interpretation of the Mishnah. That's where you see the letter. And that probably is because our main Mishnah fits better with his interpretation than it does with that of Rav Huna. Now the new Mishnah says in of the sin et agamal. This is talking about feeding animals again, but this time it's talking about force feeding. You can't force feed your camel on Shabbat. Velo dor sin. You can't push the food in, cram the food into his throat. Aval mal itin, but you can mal itin. We're going to see what these three things are. These are different ways of forcing the animal where you, to eat food um, at different levels of uh, intervention. Well, Vasin is the most in, inter, is the uh, severest intervention, and then Dorsin is a little bit less, and Malitin is the least. And he says, so it says Aval Malitin, but you can you can do the Malitin. Vein ma mirin et agalim. You can't force feed the agalim, the calves. We'll see what exactly type of Aval uh, Malitin. Again, Malitin is allowed. We'll see what exactly these are in a second. Um al ketin the tarnugolin. You can force feed the chickens. Venotnin maim la mursan, and you can mix bran with water. Aval lo govlin, but you cannot knead it together because that's what they would do. They would put bran, they would put water in bran, and they would knead it together into a kind of doughy substance, and that's what the animals would eat. A lot of times, so you're not allowed to do the kneading process, but you can pour the water. You can't put water in front of bees or in front of yonim shabashovach, in front of the uh, the doves that are living in the dovecot. But you can put water in front of the geese and in front of the chickens and in front of the um, these uh, uh, types of uh, of doves that are the uh, doves of Herod that were basically. Um, you know, doves that would live in your house. They were like domesticated uh, chickens or dom- domesticated birds, rather, that lived in your house. So uh, you're allowed to do more for domesticated than for the ones that live in the dovecote, because the ones that live in the dovecote come and go as they please. They can go do whatever they want, as we're going to see. Um, the, the ones that live in your house, they're dependent on you. If you don't put water, if you don't put food, they're not going to be able to survive. And these, uh, these uh, interventions are encouraging... Now, the force feeding is to fatten up these animals, which is why one would think that like when they make foie gras, they, they, they stuff the stuff down the goose. Yeah. It's not, not very pleasant. Okay, now we come to the Gemara. My in ovsin. What does it mean, in ovsin? What does it mean you can't... Now, evus actually means a trough. Okay? So the word ovsin is you can't trough the animal. If, if it could be a verb, that's what you would say. Okay? In other words, a trough that they eat from. It's like you're, you're saying, like, V'chamor uh, evus be'alav, from Yishayahu. The donkey knows the trough of its master, right? So ovsin is like making a verb out of it. You can't trough the animal, make it into a trough. So what does that mean? So uh, what it means is, Amar Rav Yudah says, En osin la evus You can't make its stomach into your trough, meaning you can't force a lot of food. What ovsin means is the quantity. You're putting a tremendous amount in. You're overdoing the amount. It's not just the process, but it's the quantity. Is it really true that you can you can force in that much food? Yes. In Okedama Rav Yirmiyami Difte. It's like Rav Yirmiyami Difte. He said the Didi Hazili. I saw Hahu Taya. He says Hahu Tayaya the Achala Kora Vatina Kora. I once saw an Arab who his animal ate a core of produce, which is a lot, and then he forced it to eat another core. So you're capable of really packing in the amount to the animal much more than you might think. And you're not allowed to do that on Shabbat. In Mamirin, you're not allowed to Ma'amirin, whatever Ma'amirin means. Ezohi hamra, what is hamra ava? Ezohi halata. What is, the, what is the form of force feeding that's not allowed and what is the form that is allowed? Hamra is not allowed. Halata is allowed. Hal ata, by the way, is what? What's the famous example? Esav. Esav says to Yaakov, Hal itenina. Pour it down my throat. Right? So, that's it. so you're allowed to do that on Shabbat. It's against the law. That was just a new law, right? right. That, uh, that was just in the news. That was a... Yeah, so yeah. that's why they, bought, they buy the flag law from France. <laughs> yeah, that, just, that was just in the news the, yesterday, or two days ago. They just signed that into law. It's like they feed lots to their open Well, no, it's they, like, like the rabbi said, they actually, they just literally stuff the food down. Yeah, it's really, it's really cool. By the pipes. By the pipes, right. 
Yeah, so halata, halata is what you're allowed to do. It's pouring it. Amar Rabbi Yudah Rabbi Yudah says, Hamra'a la makom sheni yuchol lahachsir. Hamra'a, what you're not allowed to do is put it into a place in the throat that there's no way for it to bring it back up. In other words, it has to go down. Halata la makom sheni yuchol lahachsir. Halata means you put it in the mouth, but it has the ability to, to spit it out if it wants to. It's, not, it's, it's still within range of uh, reverse peristalsis or whatever. You can, you can reverse the process. Um, okay, now, um, so... Uh, so Rav, Rav Chizda says, Rav Chizda, Amar Idiv Idiv Lamakom Sheni Yuchol Alachzir. Both are talking about cases where you put the food in a place where it can't be forced back out, where the animal is forced to swallow it. So what's the prohibited form? Fam Rabekli Halata Bayad. The difference is that one is using a vessel, in other words, using a fork or a pipe or whatever. That's not allowed on Shabbat. Using the hand is allowed. So according to so the machloket here is according to Rav Yehuda any force feeding where the animal cannot push it back out and in other words any putting of the food in a place where it must go down is not allowed according to Rav Chizda uh, you're allowed to put the food where it doesn't come back up but you're not allowed to use a tool to do it like a fork or whatever or a, p- a pipe Mativ Rav Yosef and this is talking about on Shabbat so apparently they would do this during the week anyway so Mativ Rav Yosef Rav Yosef objected Mahal Ketin Golin you can force feed the chickens. Um, but, and, and you can definitely malkitin. So we don't know exactly what these two terms are. Mehalkitin and malkitin. Okay? You can't malkitin, to, which, is, uh, which is the lighter of the two things. Because it says you can mehalkitin and you can definitely malkitin. But you can't even malkitin to the yone shovach and the yone aliyah, to the doves that come and go from the attic or from the dove coat. And certainly you can't do the more severe intervention. If you can't even do the lighter intervention. So the question is, my mahal ketin or my mahal ketin? What is the lighter and the more severe intervention that's being discussed here? So, ile ma mahal ketin, desafele biadayim. Now, if we're going according to Rav Yehuda's view, that force feeding to the point that the animal cannot regurgitate it is never allowed on Shabbat. So then we have to say that mahal ketin means you push down the food with your hands. That's the severest of intervention that's, that's allowed anyway. And mahal ketin dishadele kamayu. And so what does it mean mahal ketin? That you put it in front of the animal or you put it in its mouth but you didn't force it down. That could be the only way. But that would imply that you can't even feed the doves of the dove coat at all. Because you're saying that you, you can't do anything with them. You can't even feed them. You can't even put the food in front of them. So therefore, what do we say then? We, it must be like what Rav Chizda said. That there are, the two interventions are either forcing it down the throat or just putting it in the mouth. Putting it in the mouth is okay for every type of animal. Forcing it down is only okay for the chickens, but not for the doves that come and go. And using a kli is never allowed. Using a vessel is never allowed. That must be the halakha. So, but you've taught Rav Yehuda, it's a refutation of Rav Yehuda. Because according to Rav Yehuda's reading, you're going to have to say there are three levels. Level, the strict, the biggest intervention is forcing it, you know, is forcing it, because according to Rav Yehuda, there's only two levels. That's the problem. Right? According to Rav Yehuda, there's only two levels. Forcing it where it can't go any, where the animal can't spit it out. Putting it in the throat, but the animal still can spit it out and putting it in front of the animal. Those are the only three levels. According to Rav Chizda, you have three levels. Also, forcing it down with a vessel. That's what's not allowed on Shabbat. Putting it in its mouth without forcing it down. Without, without, uh, without using a... Uh, you know, where, where it can regurgitate, where it can, yeah, right. So, in other words, everyone has three levels. According to Rav Chista, the severest level is using a vessel. Second level is where it can't spit it out. Third level is just putting it in its mouth. Rav Yehuda has to have three levels too. His three levels are forcing it down the throat where it can't spit it out, which is not allowed on Shabbat. Middle level is putting it in its mouth where it can spit it out, which is allowed. And what's the third level going to be? Just putting it in front of it. So, according to this, are you going to say that you can't even put food in front of these uh, yonim? How could it be? So that's why we're rejecting Rav Yehuda because everyone has to have three levels. Everyone agrees the third level or the, you know, the most intense level is not allowed on Shabbat and the other two are allowed. And everybody agrees that whatever the, that you can't do any, that whatever the third level is, is not allowed even with the Yonim. In other words, that third level, as light as it is, is not allowed with the doves. So according to Rav Chizda, that would mean you can't put it in their mouth, but you can put it in front of them. According to Rav Yehuda, you can't even put it in front of them. That seems crazy. So the Gemara says no. That 
Amar lach Rav Yehuda, Rav Yehuda will answer you. Le'olam, me'al kitin de safei le'biadayim. Me'al kitin de shadei le'kamayu. I'm going to hold on to my position. The three levels are stuffing it down the throat, putting it in the throat, and putting it in front of them. I'm going to hold by that. However, and you're asking me, well, does that mean the Mishnah Kamayu? Nami lo. I agree, you can't even put food in front of the doves that live in the dove coat or that live in the attic. You can't. Why? Because Hane Mizonotan Alecha. Mizonotan Alecha. Because you're only allowed to feed an animal that's dependent on you. Kidatani, as we learned in the Braita. Notnin Mizonot Lefne Kelev and Notnin Mizonot Lefne Chazir. You can put food in front of a dog on Shabbat, but you can't put food in front of a pig. Omahi Fresh Ben What's the difference? Because one is dependent on you. The dog is coming to you because it's your dog. It needs you. The pig doesn't need you. Because you don't raise any pigs, God forbid, Rashi says. You're not going to be raising any pigs. The Arur Yehudi, Yehudi Shigadil Chazirim, Rashi says. Cursed is the Jew that raises pigs. Raising pigs is no good. So the pig definitely is not your pig. So why are you feeding it? Now, Amar Ravashi, Ravashi says, You can also show a proof from our Mishnah. What's the proof of our Mishnah? Because it said in our Mishnah, you can't put water in front of the bees and in front of the doves and the dovecoats. But you can put water in front of the geese, in front of the chickens, and in front of the domesticated birds. So, this is a proof for Rav, Yehud, Rabbi, for Rav Yehuda. That you're not even allowed to put food in front of an animal if it's not, if it's not related to you, so to speak. If it's not yours, if it's not dependent on you. So the doves that fr- go, come and go freely, the bees come and go freely. So putting water in front of them is not necessary. So, uh, however, the chickens and the geese and the domesticated birds, they're dependent on you. That's why you're allowed to give them water. That proves Rav Yehuda. That disproves Rav, the Rav Chizda then. Because Rav Chizda is going to have to account for that. And say that, oh, you're right, the three levels must be, you can't even put food in front of them, putting it in their throat and putting it in their mouth. So no, ulitamech, ma'ir yamaya, so why then does the Mishnah say water? It can't be a proof for Rav Yehuda. We're not disagreeing with Rav Yehuda. We're not disproving him. But the Mishnah doesn't prove him. Why? Because it specifies water. You shouldn't be able to put anything in front of the bees or in front of the doves, according to Rav Yehuda. Why does it mention water? We could actually say that, no, maybe you're allowed to feed the uh, yonim. You're allowed to feed the doves. You're allowed to feed these uh, free, free-roaming free animals. The only thing is water you're not allowed to give them because they can easily access water. There's water everywhere. So you're allowed to give them food though. So you can't prove Rav Yehuda. Rav Yehuda is holding that you cannot feed them at anything and it's just using water as an example. But do we have to say that? Do we have to say that water is an example? No, we could say that maybe water is specifically chosen in the Mishnah because water is so readily available. But other food that's not readily available, maybe you'd be allowed to feed the animals. So we can't prove conclusively. But still, that's what Rav Yehuda maintains. Rav Yehuda is following the Brayta that says you can only feed animals that are dependent on you. Okay? Now, and that's why many say, don't feed the, you're not allowed to throw uh, bread into the, that, that's, you know, into the, uh, if, there's, if there are fish at Tashlich and you throw the bread in, you're feeding these fish, they don't need your bread, you're feeding them. It's a problem. Because it's Rosh Hashanah. Even if it's Rosh Hashanah, you're not allowed to. Yeah. Well, so now the Gemara says, uh, like this, Darash, Rabbi Yonah, Apitchad Ben Rabbi Yonah was teaching at the house of the Exilarch. My Dichtiv Yodea Tzadik Ben Dalim, that the righteous one knows the difference. That he knows Din Dalim. He knows the judgment of the poor people. Okay? So, or of the needy. So it means Hashem knows the Din Dalim, how to deal with the um, with the uh, downtrodden or the needy. Yodea HaKadosh Baruch that means the Holy One, blessed be He, knows Bakelev about the dog. Shem Mizonotav Mu'atin, that it gets very little in terms of food. And therefore... That's why Hashem makes it digest its food very slowly. It is, Hashem designed the dog to digest food slowly. As we learned in the Mishnah, that basically there's a halacha that it, let's say a dog would eat some dead, there's a dead body and a dog eats some of it. So now the, the flesh of a dead body is mitameh. It's a source of Tumah. So if the dog comes into your house and he's under the same roof as you, there's actually dead flesh under the same roof as you. Now as long as the dog is alive, the Tumah doesn't come out. But let's say the dog dies now. 
and you know that yesterday he just ate the flesh of a corpse. So that flesh is in his belly is going to bring Tumat into your house. If it's, been th- if it's within three days. Because we say that that flesh is still intact for three days. If, d- if other types of animals ate the flesh of a dead body, that's why it says dagim, ofot, birds, fish, anything else, if it dies in your house, we're going to say the second that it, ha- it brought the food into its system, it was digested. It, the, the amount of time it takes to drop it in the fire and it would be consumed. That's what it says. Okay, shetipol, well, what was the exact word there? Kedei shetipol la'ur v'tisaref, the amount of time it takes to fall into the fire and be burnt. So it's immediate. So if the chicken ate cor- something from a corpse yesterday, a kazai ate worth of a corpse yesterday, for sure by now it's gone. The, you know, a few minutes later it will be gone. We learn from this that it is the way to give meat to the animals. In other words, we give food to our anim- to, to dogs. We throw food to dogs. And how much? Amar Rav Mari. Rav Mari says the size of the ear of the dog. It rhymes, but it, it sort of rhymes. Meshach udne vechutra abatre. It sounds like a saying that they used to say, which means give it a piece of flesh the size of its ear, and chase it at, and chase it with a stick. Why? Because you don't want it to come back. Because what happens if you feed a dog once, comes back again? Feed a cat, forget it. They start living in your house. If you ever fed a, an outside cat, well, if you feed a, a stray cat one time, they will never leave. So you have to be careful when you feed animals. So it says, give it a piece of meat the size of its ear and chase it with a stick so it doesn't start following you around. This is only if you're in the wild, but if you live in the city, forget it. If you give a random dog a piece of meat once, he's going to follow you around for the rest of his life. If you live in the city, if you see him in the wild, he'll never see you again. But if he lives in the town, he's going to camp out at your house 24-7 and have a vigil there waiting for the next piece of meat you're going to throw. You know that happens if you feed any animals from the outside. It always happens. So now, Amar Papa Papa says, Let de aniyami kalba. There's no, do- there's no animal poorer than the, than the dog. And... Let de atir me chazira. And there's no richer animal than the pig. Why is that? Because the dog doesn't get, you know, they don't give it that much in terms of the food that it needs. It's particular about what it will eat, and it doesn't get given as much. For the, for the pig, it will eat anything. So if you'll eat anything, if you have no standards, you're rich. Because you can eat anything. If you eat any garbage, you're rich. A dog is per- relatively particular about what they're going to eat. Although my dog used to eat cat food. When we weren't looking, it would go eat the cat's food, but at least it's food. You know, Tanya kevate de Rav Yehuda. There's a bright that supports Rav Yehuda explicitly. Ezohi amra'a, ve'ezohi halata. What are these two types of force feeding? The former form is the one that you're not allowed to do on Shabbat. The latter form you're allowed to do. So amra'a marbitza upokeset pia umachila kashinin umayim bevatachat. Hamra'a means you op- you make it lie down, you for- you hold its mouth open with something, and you force feed it basically karshinin. That's the um, the actual uh, food and water at the same time. Okay, so by putting the food and water in at the same time, basically there's no way it can stop. You're pour- you're pouring it in. You're pouring the water after. You're chasing the food with the water. There's no way for it to do anything but swallow. So it has to swallow all the food. You're forcing it that way. There's no way for it to spit it out. And the other type of force feeding that you're allowed to do is that's when you, it's standing up. You give it to eat and drink standing up. But you feed it the solids first and then the liquid so you don't do it simultaneously. So you don't have it lying down with its mouth propped open. And you don't have it... Uh, that the, wa- the food and water are coming in at precisely the same time. So you don't have an issue that it can't spit it back up if it wants to. So we're just going to go a little bit further. Amar Abaye Abaye. So Mahal Katin the Tarnak Olin. We said this is, that you're allowed to feed the chickens. Amar Abaye Abaye says, Amrita Kame Demar. I said this in front of the master. Matnitin Mani, who is the, now his master was probably, he's probably talking about Rav Yosef because that was his master. Um, that who is our Mishnah following? And he said to me, Rabbi Yossi Rabbi Yehudahi, this is the opinion of Rabbi Yossi Rabbi Yehudahi. Why is it? Because it said that you could mix the bran, you could pour water into the bran, right? But you're not, allowed, you're not allowed to knead it together, but you're allowed to pour the water and the bran into one entity. So who is this Rabbi Yossi Rabbi Yehudahi? 
How so? Because Titania is willing to write that one notin the Tekemach, one notin the Tuchomayim, Acharon Chayav the Bray Rebbe. According to Rebbe Yudah Hanasi, if one person puts water and one person puts flour, that's dough. You just made dough. You don't have to do anything. That's kneading already. You don't have to do this with your hands to mix it together. Just pouring water on flour is all you need. That's considered making a dough. However, Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yudah, Omer, Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yudah says. Until you actually knead them together, it's not a dough. You haven't kneaded yet. But wait a second. How do you know that Rabbi Yosi, Rabbi Yehuda, and Rabbi would have the same argument with regard to, to this uh, bran? Because bran is not really kneaded into a dough. So maybe they argue when you're dealing with flour and water. Because when you're dealing with flour and water where you can actually make a dough, a real dough, so then there's another step ahead. You poured the water in with the flour, now you have to knead it together into one mass. But when you're dealing with bran, maybe everybody agrees that just pouring water on it, that's all you're going to get anyway. It's not going to get any better than that. Even if you mix it together, it's not really going to become a dough. It's not going to fuse into one entity. Like if you look at a dough, you can't see where the water begins and where the water ends and the flour begins. It's one entity. But you're also always going to have it just be a clumpy mass with the bran. So maybe even Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yehuda is going to say you're not allowed to do it. Not true. Because we learned explicitly in a bright time that Rabbi himself said you can't pour water into bran. And Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yehuda, Omer, you can pour water onto bran. Why can you pour water onto bran? Because that is considered, again, Rabbi, Yossi, Rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda says that you always need a separate action of mixing them together to fuse them as much as possible in order for it to be considered kneading of the dough. Rabbi says adding water is always enough. Tanu Rabbanan the Rabbis taught in Govlin Kali that you can't mix together Kali toasted flour. Now if you toast the flour it can never again mix to the, in the same way with the water. It's never going to make a dough the same way. So one, the Tanakama says you can mix it together and one says, I'm sorry, the Tanakama says in Govlin Kali you cannot mix them together Yeshomrim Govlin and one and some say you can and Amar of Chizda Man Yesh Omrim who is the some say Amar of Chizda of Chizda says Rabbi Yosi Rabbi Yehudahi that Rabbi Yosi Rabbi Yehuda is the one who says that you can mix it together why and Rashi says because the E Rabbi certainly Rabbi is not going to allow you to do it. Okay, but Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda says that you have to mix them together in order to make it a dough. So he's going to tell you that in these cases where it doesn't really become a dough, it's only prohibited rabbinically anyway. Okay, it's not really a dough, so it's not prohibited. So, according to him, you have to do it in an unusual way. How do you do it in an unusual way? That uh, Rav Chizda says, you do it in small quantities. And by doing it in small quantities of mixing this toasted grain with water, um, that, that according to Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda is going to be allowed. Okay, and they both agree that you can mix the shatit, which is a mixture of flour, oil, and water on Shabbat. Shotim Zetoma Mitzri, and that you can drink Zetoma Mitzri even though it was sometimes used for medicinal purposes. This was a drink that would sometimes be drunk normally. Vamrat in Govlin, didn't you tell me that you can't mix? How can you tell me that everyone agrees that you can mix this flour with water, this Shatit on Shabbat, when you just told me that you can't? So basically what it says is like this, that, there's, that everybody agrees that if you make a thick shatit, shatit was water and, fla- and toast, toasted grain mixed with water. So according to Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda, you're allowed to mix it together, it's no problem because it doesn't really, as long as you make it in small quantities, it's no problem. If it's a thick mixture, the Tanakhama said you can't do it at all. Rabbi Yossi says you can do it in small quantities. 
but if it's a thin mixture where it doesn't create anything that really has a, uh, it doesn't have any uh, solidness, solidity to it at all. So in that case, they both agree that you can do it on Shabbat as long as you make it in an unusual way, which would mean instead of putting the solid and then the liquid, you put the liquid and then the solid on top. That would be the way to, I'm sorry, the other way around, that in the weekday they would put the, the liquid and then mix in the solid. And on Shabbat they would put the solid and then they would put the liquid on top. That Since it's a thin mixture, it, it just looks like a murky liquid. It doesn't look like a, um, or it, it, like a granular liquid, but it doesn't really look like a, anything thick enough to qualify as a dough.